grace, his mercy, and his peace be multiplied to you. In the precious name of his Son, our Savior, Jesus. Amen. The gospel lesson for this Sunday is a challenging gospel lesson. Uh, the text... Jesus says, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have come to bring, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And a part of the challenge is that in the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, when he's announcing the Messiah's birth, says that the Messiah would be called the Prince of Peace. And Jesus said, I have not come to bring peace, I've come to bring a sword. Division in families and other relationships. Seems out of character for our Lord to say something like that. So what does this mean? When Jesus comes to us, we are introduced to a person, not a doctrine. He's a living savior. He's a savior who died and was raised from the dead. He's a savior who lives today. He's a savior who lives right now. We are introduced to the Messiah, the savior of the world. When we come to acknowledge Jesus, we accept who he is totally and completely. And we accept his word. I've never attended a public school from kindergarten through seminary, grade school, high school, junior college, senior college, seminary, all under the wing of the church. 21 years, what a blessing. I thank God for our Christian day schools. I thank God for my experience. I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. I was born into this family that were Missouri Synod Lutherans. My home church in Cleveland, Ohio, St. John's on Cable Avenue, until the day it closed, had German services every Sunday. Some of you may remember those days. English service and a German service. And in some ways, the German service was bigger than, larger than the English service. But I was born into this Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and I was happy as a member of this church body, was happy as a member of St. John's on Cable Avenue, was happy uh, to go to Cleveland Lutheran High School. But you know, now, today, I'm a member of this church body more by conviction than by birth or tradition. I'm very thankful that the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod has publicly declared that life is a sacred gift of God. Life in the womb is a sacred gift of God. I'm very thankful that our church body has so clearly declared that marriage is one man, one woman, as God declares it in his word. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. I'm very thankful that our church body has declared that this book is the inspired word of God. And it becomes our rule and our judgment in all doctrine, in all matters of faith. In this text, Jesus shows following him, believing in him as our Savior and Lord, He divides between religion and a relationship. We're not just to have a religion about Jesus. We're to have a relationship with him, a living relationship, a love relationship, a personal relationship. He is the savior who died for our sins, will receive his body and his blood in this service as assurance of that forgiveness, of that cleansing, of that blessing, of that love that he has for us. 
Jesus isn't just a religion. He is the Messiah. He is the savior of the world. And he is also the divide between the secular and the sacred. I very much appreciate all of the liturgical symbols that you have here in this church. My home church, the pastor when I was there, at that time in the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, it was not uncommon to have communion four times a year. Can you imagine that? Only four times a year. And the thinking was, if we do it too often, we'll take it for granted. And my pastor proposed that we have communion every month. And it was a big debate, a big discussion in our church whether we should have communion once a month. And he was called a papist because he had such a high regard for communion. And I'm very thankful that in this day and age in which we live, many Missouri Synod churches have communion every Sunday. The church which Gretchen and I are a member of in, uh, in Linville, uh, at the campground there, Mountainside Lutheran Church, we too have communion every Sunday. And I'm very thankful for that. And the church that I retired from, Resurrection Lutheran Church in Charlotte, all of our services on Sunday were communion services. We see and we recognize the sacredness. We see and we recognize the need that we have for Holy Communion. To partake of Holy Communion is to be hugged by God. It's as though He takes us in His holy arms and just hugs us and kisses us and says, I love you, my son. I love you, my daughter. And Jesus is the divide between the temporal and the eternal. What we do here is not just temporal. I remember one Sunday in Montgomery, Alabama, I was the pastor at the Lutheran Church of the Epiphany. We had a freestanding altar. And I remember during the communion liturgy saying, therefore with angels and archangels, in all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, and then we sang the Sanctus. And I raised my hands. And a retired pastor in that church called our district president and said I had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> to be so moved to think that in our liturgy we join with angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven and we worship God together. What a glorious thing that's going to be when we get there. <laughs> I don't know if they'll have an organ. Maybe a pipe organ. <laughs> but it's going to be glorious, the worship of Jesus. It's going to be wondrous. And Jesus may, brings that divide between the temporal. We're not here just to nod to God. We're here to worship the King of the universe. We're here to worship our Savior, our living Savior, Jesus. The gospel lesson for this Sunday is a call to put, to put him, Jesus, first in our lives. August 3rd, Gretchen and I will celebrate our 60th wedding anniversary. I love her more than I love any other human being. <clears throat> but the text is clear. Jesus needs to be first. And I will tell you, when we make Jesus first, then it's easy to love. It's easy to love our spouse. It's easy to love our children. I love all of our children, all four of our children, our eight grandchildren. I love them all. But a part of that is the blessing of loving Jesus first. He creates that love 
He creates that love in me for my wife, Gretchen. He creates that love in me for our children and their spouses and for our grandchildren. I want to read again from the Gospel lesson a few verses. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous, righteous person's reward. If anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. What do we see and learn here? First of all, Jesus says that when you welcome me, you welcome the one who sent me. We acknowledge that Jesus is the gift that the Father sent. He is the gift to us. He is our Savior. He's our Lord. He's our God. And Jesus identifies with his followers, his disciples, his children. When we show love to one another, we show love to Jesus. And it's because of his love that we can show that love to one another. And Jesus identifies the reward of service. Service with compassion. He acknowledges that he sees these things that we do silently and quietly in our hearts. As challenging as this text was for me, it is the word of God. And it's a good word. It's a blessed word. It's an encouraging word. It's a word of love and a word of grace. God bless you in Jesus' name. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.